Uh, great. So thanks, Open Jihad, OEM, Iraq, for inviting us, uh, especially to this great town of Bolzano. I hope people have been trying out the gelatos. Um, I'm Joaquin from Open Earth Foundation. I know the name's not the most creative. Uh, I think we have a creativity problem in the climate space. All the organizations and names similar, so not directly related to the Open Earth Monitor. Uh, as director of product, probably I'm the most first away from the technicals of the nitty gritty of the data and closer maybe to the users. So I'll be talking more about use cases and how this relates to to end users mainly and what we've been doing. I'll be talking about how we built open climate and why, um, and how we move to trying to get closer to users and get this to practical users. Uh, I think at some point we all wonder why we're all building yet another data aggregation platform. I mean, we need to move closer to how we get this to have more impact. So Open Earth is a nonprofit. We work at the intersection of uh, climate change and uh, emerging tech. As I said, we are mostly focused on trying to get all the emerging data sets that are used uh, into more practical uses for different types of organizations. Um, so I think, I hope that's interesting for people here that are maybe more technical. We're looking for a lead data engineer, right? So maybe someone's uh, interested or if has a friend that's interested, you can look into our website for that. Um, as I said, we we are more closer to, to the end use case, right? We've been building products uh, in climate accounting, current pricing, now moving closer to helping cities build GEG inventories um, through spatial data, a third party spatial data, just to make that process easier. Um, we try to collaborate with most of the supranational organizations and trying to advance some of their uh, their programs uh, and trying to put some of the emerging tech that's coming out of the space into more practical uses. Um, our team is built mostly of uh, developers, product designers, product owners, data engineers, trying to build some of these products. Um, this is a scary slide. That's why it's in black and red, right? That's the, the problem. Uh, I think we all know there's a, a huge challenge, maybe what I tried to call the, the finding challenge of our generation of trying to reduce emissions, trying to stay between the the goals of the Paris Agreement, right below two, two degrees. That means reducing emissions by 50% in less than seven years now, maybe six years soon. We're not doing very good progress for that in spite of a lot of collaboration, right? When you try to see how we can coordinate towards this, maybe COVID was the, the, the best progress we had so far. So if that was man-made, maybe great, maybe no. Uh, and even though a lot of different actors having, having appearing in the space, uh, um, we still haven't had so much luck, right? The actors that have appeared and the diverse actors that have appeared uh, haven't actually been coordinating. Um, so that's what we call the global accounting gap, right? Trying to see how we can coordinate the global um, accounting process just to make sure that we can actually coordinate towards our goals, right? We see three, three main issues there. First is that there's no consolidated accounting between what's Earth data, right? What's happening on the planet level and what the different world actors are reporting. So the first level is planet or physical space and actors. The second is that there's no linkage between actions being done at the state level, right? So countries and subnational states or non-state actors, right? And then there's also no clear incentives for these non-state actors. Uh, to do accounting or have accountability of what they do, right? So there's three, three levels. Um, based on that, we, we built the, the Open Climate Network Explorer, which we've been aggregating multiple emissions data for actors at all levels, right? Through, through a common schema, try to see, get a, a, a planetary vision of how the different emissions uh, reported by actors actually um, when collected, we can see if there's an actual progress toward the Paris Agreement, especially in this nested way, right? So what we've been doing here is aggregating these emissions data sets, going down to the project levels, into a company, state, country, and international level. So try to be able to navigate this in a, in a nested way, right, for a nested accounting um, framework and calling what we and doing what we call the 
digitally enabled independent global stock take, right? So the global stock take uh, by the UNFCCC takes place every five years and uh, it doesn't include subnationals, which are some of the, or either other non-state actors, which are some of the main actors that can actually pull some of the levers to reduce emissions, right? So as you do, we built a working group, right? To be able to define the standards needed and see how we work together. The Climate Action Data 2.0 working group had three main work streams, right? Data harmonization and how we standardize data, um, use cases and policy, and one focused more on digital infrastructure and architecture. Um, and based on this, we built what's called the Open Climate Network, right? So as I said, we have this three levels or, or four levels in which you have non-state actors, state actors, and the UN and the Earth, right? And uh, thus nested. The platform has two main verticals. First, what we what I'm going talking about more right now, which is Explore, which is actually exploring the different emissions, uh, seeing the different data sets, harmonizing them in the same data schema so they can be interoperable and comparable. And then more an account part, which is what I'll call afterwards, I'll see afterwards on how we help actually cities um, build their own reports for emissions and report them, right? Um, so this is the, I, I, I switched to share a bit of the platforms we've built um and, uh, and talk a bit more about this so for, for example the the open climate platform which is this one um allows you to look for let's say different data sets for different type of actors so not only countries but you're able to find companies facilities uh regions provinces cities so for example here we are in the us you can find a lot of different data sets of aggregated all of this have been harmonized with the same data schema. You can also, there's an open API, so you can access to this, you can download them, you can use them as you want for different years. Uh, there's some contextual data more for, for use case specific, just for people to understand what it means. We've been tracking commitments based on also the emissions, so how they're doing and some time series they have. You can go deeper into these actors. So for example, since all these actors are nested, you can see how they relate to each other. So you'll find California, same thing. You have different data sets here, uh, how it relates contextually to its parent actor. You see also their commitments. But then if you go maybe deeper into some, so let's say let's go to Santa Barbara, for example, you start seeing some of these gaps, right? So since this is collaborative open source, um, we have this call to actions for people to collaborate with data if they have more. So if you live here, for example, or you have this data set, or you're working on this as a data scientist, you can uh, you can uh, collaborate with this. Um, and another project we've done is, for example, uh, also this is more use case specific to the DIGS platform, so the independent global stock take that, that we presented at Bonn and New York Climate Week is you're able to see how the subnational actors inside of one actor compare to each other. So for example, in Canada, you have here the, the emissions that Canada has committed to, to having by 2030 in their NDC, so their commitments. But then when you go into the actual uh, subnationals, what they're aiming at, uh, they have much more emissions, right? So Canada wants to be uh, at 450, let's say, but if you go to each independent uh, province, they're aiming to reach almost 600. So there's clearly not a very good coordination between uh, a nation and its subnationals. Same thing when you see what they've committed to, to reducing. Um, this, there's a Python client for to play with this if you want. Uh, everyone can get this data and start doing this type of analysis. Same thing if we're here, so let's go to Canada as well. Uh, you'll see for every data set that we have, how they're doing on the reduction commitments. So they've committed to reducing 40%, but still closer to a baseline. You can see this for many other countries. Um, and we've also reviewed, for example, which uh, some national, which countries have some nationals that have target commitments? So you can explore that as well. Um, but what we found here, you can see, is that although countries have um, emissions data and they're sharing emissions data, when you start going to regions and cities, so the sub nationals, there's not much, not much data. So I'll, I'll go into that afterwards of what we're focusing on now and how spatial data is super key to trying to help this less resourceful uh, organizations be able to prepare some of their GAG inventories to see how we're doing towards this. Um, so let's get back to the screenshot, to, to the presentation. So we've built the data model, right? It's open source uh, and it's designed um, to track the climate action across these different data sets. 
Um, it treats every actor in the same way. So a data set, uh, the data model or schema can be used for every type of different actor. So either if it's a country, a region, a company, they're all the same. That means it's easier to stack up and nest. Um, and it's been designed uh, with data-driven Ember Lab, which is one of the organizations we collaborate with and also the climate action data community. Um, also feel free to, in a GitHub, you can look at this, feel free to propose changes, use it if you need it. Um, our current uh, network has more than 67 data sources. We have more than 350 emissions records for these uh, uh, different actors. We have more than 4,000 climate pledge records and all this I said, through an API. Um, we have more than 5,000 5, regions, more than 100,000 cities, uh, and 33,000 company facilities. So all of this easily accessible and ready to be used. Uh, there's an open API for all this, right? You can check our GitHub if you want to see how to use it in some of your tools uh, or solutions, and also a Python client that explains tutorials that you can see how you can do. Some of the things I was sharing on the platform, you can see how we did those analysis. Um, but as I was sharing, um, we found that cities and regions, which we think are the most relevant actors in reducing emissions, were the ones that are actually uh, less supported to do so, right? So cities and regions represent 70% of global emissions. When you look at uh, in a consumption-based view, um, to access financing to implement climate action uh, initiatives, they need a GAG inventory first, right? That's some of the requirements development banks or other organizations ask for them to be able to have a climate action plan, uh, but only 5% have GAG inventories, right? So that's really far away from what we need. Uh, and if you look at commit and the ones that actually track are more likely to act upon them, which is knowledge is power, I guess, or you can uh, manage what you can measure. Uh, when you look at their commitments, right, uh, having targets, uh, also less than 20% have targets for that. So that's something we need to see how we increase. Um, so what we did here is when we found out that there was a case, as we are more of a product organization, let's say we started interviewing cities and city experts. So we interviewed more than 30 cities at this point all over the world, more than 15 city experts as well. What I found out is that preparing a GAG inventory uh, takes a four person team more than six months, right? Uh, to collect the data and prepare it. And most of the friction is in actually collecting the data. They have to ask it to different um, Departments in the in the in their country which might have different political colors or they don't might not have any data um, expertise to use it. There's a lot of uh, limited capacity in these governments, especially smaller city governments, especially global south. I come from Argentina. We've talked about with Argentinian cities, and it's very hard for them. We've actually there's one of the of the cities we talked to and what they did is they they printed out the excel sheet cut it out and gave it to the different people of different departments to fill it out and then collect it again so that's that's some of the process that's being done sometimes and when you get this super um um involved uh technical people that are pushing forward to building this for cities being this capacity when they leave to other other places other jobs all that knowledge is lost um, the data that they get is very heterogeneous and messy. It's very hard to aggregate and actually build something. And there's no tools. Most tools that exist are maybe huge excels that take months to learn. Uh, so this is uh, the blockers for cities to actually have some of this data. Uh, so that's where City Catalyst comes in, which is the tool we're building now, more focused on actually uh, getting data in the hands of people that implement uh, some of this um, climate actions. Uh, we presented this in your climate week with gcom c40 uh, and other of our partners um what we're doing here is trying to leverage emerging data sets and and emerging ai tools um to optimize this process right so basically is we think there's a lot of ready to use data the, uh, from spatial data that can be um formatted for cities to already have at hand so they don't need to collect it um, and be able to at least get a good enough GG inventory to start. And then seeing we're, we're building chatbots uh, and data harmonization engines to help them uh, use that data in effective ways, at, le at least simple ways, but effective ways, so that they can get the GG inventory, prepared, uh, prepare a climate plan, and get some financing to implement action. Um, so the way we see it is 
there's some of these three levels. I think yesterday there was also an organization uh, presentation on the different sort of the, the supply chain of the data, right? So we have the raw set data that comes from satellite uh, companies, organizations that are preparing data. Then some of the data products uh, are being built into turning the data into something that's more useful. And then where we come in is in actually building tools that leverage all this data, right? So organizations like Climate Trace, Google EIE, uh, some of the data sets also of Open Earth Monitor are super useful for us to try to implement into uh, specific use case for cities. Um, on, I, I don't know if I'll get enough time to, to go into some of this use case examples, but in the workshop tomorrow, I'll be going deeper into how we're using some of these different uh, data sets that we have from different organizations into actually uh, the hands of cities for the different uh, GG inventory frameworks they have, so they can use them. Um, and we'll try to map uh, what's missing or how we could do where we have a lot of gaps. Um, so the, the City Catalyst uh, platform is also an open source platform, right? It has ready to use data sets and intuitive UI, and it's starting first on helping um, cities have a GEG inventory that they can report to CEP uh, and other organizations, but also to manage what, what, where they need to implement climate actions. But we're, we'll be moving forward into uh, adaptation, climate action plans, et cetera, as we go. So we, we leverage um, next-gen data solutions, right? Try to see how we can leverage all the satellite data that people here are working on to make it useful, um, combining it with local data providers as well, right? To, to populate the inventory easily, uh, have a, a user experience that's simple and that doesn't need months of training, right? That you learn as you go uh, and integrating all this with other digital tools to create APIs, right? We want to reduce the time it takes to build a GG inventory from six months to maybe a couple of weeks so that cities can focus on actually implementing climate action and not having to focus on uh, collecting data and preparing data. Uh, we're building an open API for this, right? Uh, to be able to access all this data. Um, this is still very work in progress, but um, you'll be able to find this in our GitHub as well. So we'll collect all the open data that we have from different uh, spatial data providers and sort of adapt it to be able to be used in, in GEG inventory framework um, and also some private data that we're trying to get access to. Um, and tomorrow uh, I, I, we can go deeper into some of this on how to actually use the spatial data to build GEG inventories. What will be something super useful is hearing a lot from people that are working on or trying to get uh, data to be more uh, useful um, or have practical uses on how we can fill out sort of this map of how we build a GG inventory for a city, but also think about um, business models for some of this data, other data sets that are relevant apart from GG inventories for cities, because I think there is a lot of effort that we're doing uh, as an industry, uh, a lot of money being spent, a lot of resources, a lot of brain power, but what we actually need is for this data to be useful to face this challenge, right? So we need to find ways of make of connecting data with end users, and then users that will be totally not uh, tech savvy, right? They just need uh, they don't care about the the grid system that we're using or or the standards or if it's interoperable or not. Uh, they just want to be able to improve the quality of life. For example, in our use case, we just see this improve the quality of life for its citizens and make sure that we can uh, keep uh, the, the boundaries of our planet in a, in a healthy spot. So if that seems interesting for you uh, and you want to start reviewing some of the work we have already on the, on the, um, the map, you can use this cool AI generated QR code that should work. Uh, this is some of the, I think this is the coolest thing that came out of generative AI that you can use QR codes that this one looks out of a QR code, but you, some that don't look as much as a QR code and they still work. Or if you just want to prefer to type it, you can look into that and start seeing what we have, uh, we don't have, start putting down post-its if you want, and then we can discuss on how to get closer to making use of the data uh, in order to, to face this challenge. So yeah, I think that's it. Thanks so much. I don't know if we have time for questions or not. Thank you so much, Joaquin. Do we have any questions? Anyone? Uh, 
Any questions? Is the microphone on the other side in case? Yeah. Okay, I'll kick off. Um, sure. You showed this uh, uh, the climate um, climate what is it? open climate open climate yeah. network yeah. So and you showed that people can look at multiple sources of data, hmm. but our experience is with the users that they are they are confused. You know, you you want to provide something more comprehensive, but actually they get confused. So they go like, which which source do I use? Which one do I trust? How do you solve yeah, that? Yeah, that, that's been a learning experience for us as well, right? We've been trying to navigate who our user was, right? Either like more technical users that want to see everything, like power users, or people that just want to be fed uh, the information. I think on our new initiative of City Catalyst, we're trying to make it as simple as possible and as guided as possible, because in the end, it's trying to see how that can be, be useful for, for actual action. Um, I, I, I don't have an answer there. Um, I think it depends a lot of the user, but, and we, we've tried to be as agnostic as possible with split this platform, just aggregating the data and not trying to guide on what is the better data set or not, just like showing the methodology, showing the data source and having people decide for themselves. Um, but I, ha I think that hasn't been super successful on, on users that just might get lost sometimes, right? Or they need guidance on what's what to think or what to use. But I think data scientists probably like to go into more of the methodology and understand. And, and just a, one more question, because yep. this is a, you know, we are European Commission funded project in this event largely. Yep. And one of the Copernicus biggest achievement is the Sentinel-5, which has the two kilometer resolution monitors, I think every few weeks. Are you using that, uh, the emissions, direct emissions? So we, we haven't integrated that, that yet. We have a backlog that we're integrating so far. Um, we've integrated Edgar, which I think might use uh, Copernicus. Uh, I think it's also, yeah, one kilometer grid. Um, but yeah, we're trying, to, we're, we're trying to get everything that we have. Um, our use case is global, so for every type of city. Um, so we're trying to get a coverage on, on, on the whole planet just to make it easier to, to ingest spatial data for, for the... No, we have questions here, case. Peter. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for the great talk, Joaquin. Um, I'd have a question related to the actual Open Earth Monitor Cyber Infrastructure Project. I don't know if you've mentioned it, but are there any plans to integrate your platform in some of the use cases, monitors or accounting tools or whatever is going on in the OEMC project? So, so the, that's why we call him here, here yeah. <laughs> to talk. Yes. Yeah, I, I think that's that's how our collaboration started anyway with, with Tom when we first met is how to integrate both. Um, the, the idea is through the Open API to make it as easier to integrate and bridge with different platforms. We, even if we've built a platform for Open Climate Network, the the main value we see is the API, so people could bridge this data into each other. I think the value is not necessarily the UI, but actually having all these data sets that you could plug into. So the idea is, of course, to keep on integrating. At this point, as an organization, we're moving closer to the less on the aggregating platform and more closer to the use case platform for Cedicalist. So we might not sort of like advance too much on what Open Climate is here. It will stay as a beta and we'll keep on integrating other data sets, but not maybe move that much into, into to just you know connecting different uh, different platforms, but we'll for sure use uh, sort of like we'll we'll try to plug into most of the data sets that exist. So if Open Earth Monitor has data sets that we have, and we'll look into that tomorrow in the workshop, we'll try to integrate them, of course, and connect with us. Thanks. One more question here, Simone. Hi, I'm Simone Sabatini from the IGOS uh, uh, project. I was wondering well, if you integrated in this part also the, um, the in situ, let's say, measurements. Uh, uh, and because uh, I, uh, I know that now the, there is an interest to focus on in cities, and which is also, this is also that something in IGOS we are now considering there is a, a, a parallel project, let's say, which is called IGOS Cities. Uh, where uh, a bunch of measurements are um, concentrated, let's say, in 15 cities around Europe, or this is the, the aim at least. 
Uh, where also policymakers, local policymakers are involved, uh, where I think so it is a, a good way to um, encourage encourage them to, to, to make this inventory part, which is the more critical, as you point out. So maybe this is something that can be interesting. And I was wondering if you already... Uh, yeah, so we've uh, partnered in some ways with uh, C4, TG, Com, ICLE, some of the main city networks, right, that are... Uh, uh, guiding on, on the policies of the different cities are are, interact, are are implementing. So idea is for this to be as uh, closer as possible to what's actually happening in the city and what's being advocated from, from the policy setters. Uh, and also we work closely with a lot of cities just building what they need and how they can help uh, define more policies. So so yeah, we, 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 we try to work as close as possible with, with policy setters uh, and especially this city networks, either uh, global or regional city networks uh, that are the, the main engine behind uh, the the climate work that cities do right usually as yes, when they when they join these networks that's when they start uh moving forward with that i don't know if that answers the question but i i, I thought that was where it's, it was going <laughs>